Father in heaven, we love you. We need a lot of help. And Lord, we need to, to be more proactive when it comes to witnessing for you. Bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Very practical because let me tell you why I want to do this. I was talking to a man a few years ago. He's probably in his 60s or 70s. And we were talking about winning souls to the kingdom or leading people to Christ. And he said, I'll never forget what he told me. He said he can't recall in his entire life ever leading someone to Jesus. How is that even possible? <laughs> I'll just give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he forgot. But brothers and sisters, we are called to share with others what we believe. I really believe that. Amen. I really believe it. <laughs> and so for an elderly gentleman to say, I have no idea when I led somebody to Jesus is very, very sad. So let's get into the presentation here. Save to serve. You know, some people think that, that pastors do all the work. That doesn't make any sense. No training. Many would be willing to work if they were taught how to begin. That's from Christian service. Okay? So if they're taught how to begin, she says many will work. We should not be lazy Christians. Isn't that right? We have something that this world desperately needs. We have a message. We're not, we're not better than anybody. We're not better than the Baptist or the Jehovah's Witness. We have a particular message, and we need to share. Why? Jesus says he needs help. The Bible says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can what? Work. So a day is going to come when you can't even work. Time is going to come, we know, when religious freedom will be snatched away from us. So we need to be working while we can, while there is no um, religious persecution. My point this afternoon is just do something for Jesus. Do something. You should never let a week go by without telling somebody about Jesus. You know that? You should never. It actually, actually um, the, the Bible teaches it should be daily. You know, daily we should be sharing something every single day. Look at that later. So we need to work. Who was the first worker in the Bible? Okay. Don't say Adam. Who else? <laughs> Who was the first worker in the Bible? Okay. Let's go to the Bible. <laughs> Answer that question. Very practical. The Bible says in Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, who is the first worker in, in the Bible? Because it gives us a principle on to how we should work. Genesis 2 verse 1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his uh, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. So according to the Bible, who is the first worker in the Bible? God, verse 1. Now go to verse 31 of chapter 1. Verse 31 says of chapter 1, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was what? Very good. You know what the Bible shows us here? It shows us that when it came to work for God, he did not believe in mediocrity. Oh, my Lord, yeah, that's right. God believes in doing the best that you can for him. No such thing as laziness in 2016. 
So God looked back at his work. He said, wow, what I did was very good. And we're children of the Most High, so we don't believe in mediocrity also. So God is the first worker. That's the principle there. Do the best, whatever you're doing. The Bible says and that knowing that the time, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. That he says there's too many people sleeping here. And he's talking about spiritual sleep, not literal. He's saying, hey, time is short. Salvation is nearer than when we first believed. He said, hey, hey, wake up. Do something for Jesus. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Lest us, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Evangelism, page 229. Don't miss these quotes. The work that should long ago have been in active operation to win souls to Christ has not been done. The time is near when large cities will be swept away and all should be warned of the coming judgments. Mm, that's interesting. According to this quote, how many people should be warned of the coming judgment? Oh, if you knew destruction was coming, wouldn't you want somebody to tell you if they knew? Yeah, so that's why, that's why we share, as Seventh-day Adventists, we know more than any other denomination how this world is going to go down. And we know how it's going to transpire in the last days. And she says, look, entire large cities will be swept away. we got to share, brothers and sisters. She goes on to say, Oh, that God's people had a sense of the impending destruction of thousands of cities, now almost given to idolatry. That God's people had a sense. In other words, you know, everybody's different. I don't know how you are in your private times, but when she says, if we had a sense, she's basically saying, do we have any urgency do we have an urgent spirit about us to tell others about Jesus? Because cities are going to be swept away one day. And so the question is, how urgent is it for you or for me to be a witness for Jesus? Okay? She goes on to say, page 32, Often we have been told that our cities are to hear the message. But how slow we are to heed the instruction. I saw one standing on a high platform with arms extended. He turned and pointed in every direction, saying, so this one person, she says we're slow, standing on a platform, and he's pointing in every direction, pointing, 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 and listen to what he's saying. A world perishing in ignorance of God's holy law, and seventh-day Adventists are what? Ooh. That's tough, folks. She's not talking about any other denomination but ours. Because why? Because we know what's coming. She says this man is pointing everywhere and he's saying, hey, Adventist, why are you sleeping? Let's be doing something for Jesus. All right? This quote says, in many churches, tragically, the pastor has become the primary shepherd, soul winner, fundraiser, organizer, administrator, and errand boy. According to the New Testament, however, it is actually the members in the pews who are to be the primary shepherds of the flock and the primary soul winners. Wow. Members in the pews. That's you, that's you all. According to the quote, you all are supposed to be the primary soul winners. Inviting people to church. Giving Bible studies. You can have a small group, etc. Just do something for the master. The need of involvement. The work of God in this earth can never be finished until men and women comprising our church membership rally to the work and unite their efforts with those of ministers and church officers, gospel workers. So the folks in the pews are supposed to unite with the ministers and then we work together. Does that make sense? That makes sense. I really want to go knocking doors sometime with this church family. 
The Bible says, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the, harvest, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. According to this, is the problem with the harvest, yes or no? Yeah. No, not according to that. The problem is with the laborers. That's the problem. <laughs> the harvest, out those folk out there, they're out there. No problem with them. But God says the laborers, few. Uh, very bold. I mean, in other words, Jesus is saying, do something. Do something for the kingdom. That's what I'm stressing this afternoon. Please, please do something for Jesus. And we'll talk about some practical ways. How? Well, we need to pray. Do you agree with that? We need to pray. Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12. Isn't that fascinating? Before Jesus selected one disciple, what did he do first? Pray. He understood the importance of what he was about to do in selecting these 12 men. Now these guys were a bunch of hard heads, but he still selected them. So he prayed, so therefore we need to pray as well. If Jesus saw the necessity to pray, before we hit these streets, we have to pray. I told you a few weeks ago, I went across the street here. You know those, those green apartments across the street? It's kind of rough over there. This area is kind of rough. I don't, I don't advise you going by yourself. I went by myself. I don't advise that. But nonetheless, I went, gave out some glow tracks, had a good time, very good time because I was working for the master. Point is, do something for Jesus. Pray. Why do we pray? I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do how much? He said, you can't do anything. You know, sometimes, you know, we tend to rely on our strength. Jesus says, without me, you can't do anything. So you got to pray. You got to ask for help and guidance. Okay? At the sound of fervent prayer, Satan's whole host, what everybody? Ooh. Man, that's a, that's a very solemn quote. <laughs> she says, when you pray, the whole host of darkness, they're shaking. There's a power in prayer. Sometimes we don't understand. It's powerful. So we have to pray. Now this is the prayer that we um, say in the morning, okay? Consecrate yourself to God in the morning. Make this your very first work. Let your prayer be, take me, O Lord, as holy thine. I lay all my plans at thy feet. You, now listen to him. Use me, what's this everyone? In thy, what's that word? Abide with me and let all my work be wrought in thee. This is a, what's that word right there? Matters. That's Steps of Christ, page 70. Oh. I hope you really understand this quote, how serious it is. She says, every single day that we live, we're supposed to pray this prayer, Lord, use me today. You know, I pray that every day. Oh, God, use me today. Somebody, somebody needs Jesus out there. I was at the restaurant just last week, BJ's and the waitress there, <coughs> helping us. I said, hey, can I ask you a question? You know, I'm a minister, and I like asking people questions. I said, do you believe, I said, are you a Christian? She said, yes. I said, okay. I said, do you believe that Jesus will come soon? And she said, yes. And I said, how do you know? She says, by what's taking place in the world is very clear. That's just what she said. So I said, hey, I said, you're right. 
So I gave her some glow tracks. I gave them to her. That was it. When I go to restaurants, I always have glow tracks to give to those waiters or waitresses. I figure, hey, I'm going to give you a tip. You better take my glow tracks. <laughs> right there. <laughs> All right. Say this glow track. And so, so it works out. But the point is, I want to be used every single day. Do something for the master. Please. What are we to be praying for? Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 2. Let's go to Ezekiel here. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 2. What are we praying for? Ezekiel chapter 2. Now, this is God, and he's sending Ezekiel, this awesome prophet, on a mission, okay? Ezekiel chapter 2, are you there? Now, the Bible says in verse 3, God is sending this, this prophet, this commission. You need to be a witness for me, says God to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 3. The Bible says, Son of man. Who's the son of man, by the way? Ezekiel. Now, Jesus is the son of man in the New Testament, but Ezekiel was also named the son of man in the Old Testament. So God says, and he said unto me, God speaking, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this day. For they are imprudent children and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, etc., etc. Question. Was Ezekiel sent to a stiff-necked, rough people? Yes. Is Fresno stiff-necked and rough, you can say? Yes. <laughs> Roughs have got some rough areas everywhere. Fresno, wherever you go, New York, L.A., the world is just bad in general. So God is sending this prophet to a bad world. And listen to, what has, listen to what has to transpire in the life of Ezekiel before he is sent. In verse 2. Or verse 2. And the Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me and set me upon my feet that I heard him that spake unto me. According to the, Bi the Bible, before Ezekiel was sent to the stiff-necked people, what, what uh, had to empower him before he left? Holy Spirit. So when we're praying, we're praying, yes, God, use me for your glory to win somebody. But Lord, I need the Holy Ghost. These people out here in Fresno and Clinton and Ashland, these people are hard-necked and they, they're stiff-hearted. They're going to reject me. Some people might curse me out. I need the Holy Ghost to use me and to soften hearts. Does that make sense? So he had, to, he had to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And then he went out. Now, when you meet people, this is a very... Have you ever seen this acronym, FORT? When you're going door to door or meeting somebody in the mall or what have you? A simple way of witnessing is to use the Ford principle. You can ask them about their family, occupation, religion, and their testimony. That's very practical. Meet somebody at the restaurant. You want to talk about Jesus or introduce Jesus to them. Yeah, so how's your family? You know, my family, I have a child, etc. I have grandkids. Hey, well, where do you work? I work. Very, very simple. Real practical. Just do something for the master, right? Just do something. So for family, occupation, religion, testimony. We speak of family first because people are usually interested in talking about their family. Don't you like your family? No one here likes their family? Oh, I like my family. <laughs> Church family, right? <laughs> you should love your family. Then we can ask about their occupation of work, followed by what religion church they may attend. And finally, share a personal testimony. The power of a testimony. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from um, death. Revelation 12, 11. Now we know that a testimony, your testimony is something no one can take from you. It's yours. 
when you share a testimony of the power of God in your life, that person cannot reject and say, oh, well, there's no such thing. No, it happened to you, so that's your testimony. A witness. Doesn't that make sense? Right. So next to the word of God, a soul winner's testimony is the most powerful tool he or she has. The woman of Samaria led a city to Christ, and the scripture relates that many believed on him because of her what? That's awesome. You remember she, she met Jesus one day, and she went back to the village, and she gave her testimony? She said, hey, hey, come see a man that told me everything that I ever did. And because of her testimony, many people came to Jesus. Because of your testimony, your testimony is so powerful, many can come to Christ based on what you say. Of course, the Holy Ghost softening the heart. Some of you have powerful testimonies here. Some of you, I don't know, maybe you've been on drugs, maybe you've been homeless. Whatever the case is, you have a testimony to share to someone. Share your testimony. Return, return to your own house. This is about the demoniacs that were healed by Jesus. And tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. I really want you to know what, I'm, what we're doing this afternoon. Because I don't want the Asian church, I don't want anyone in here to go week after week after week absent of telling someone about Jesus. You know why? Not because I'm saying it, because it's biblical. It is Bible. Are we Bible-believing Christians, yes or no? Yes, so we follow the Bible. And the Bible says, and Ella White, um, she encourages we do it on a daily basis. See? He told those who were healed by him, hey, go to your village and tell, tell the people what Jesus did for you. Has Jesus done anything for anyone here? Hasn't Jesus done much for you? <laughs> yeah. He has done much for me. How dare I not share? Got to do it. Ten more minutes. 1 Peter 2.9, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So God has changed your life, called you from a world of darkness. Tell that to somebody else. People here, they're in darkness in this place. This place is wicked. Fresno, one of the wickedest cities I saw on Yahoo or something. Bad. <laughs> that which will be most effectual in the, is the testimony of our own experience. Listen to this. These precious acknowledgments to the praise of the glory of his grace when supported by a Christ-like life have an irresistible power that works for the salvations of souls. Salvation of souls. Desire of Ages, page 347. She says your testimony, your experience, she said it is very effectual. But she says you have to have a Christ-like life. You got to be Christ-like. You can't tell somebody about the goodness of God and that person, your friend or family member, see you cursing somebody out. I say, hey, how's God working in your life? <laughs> no, we have to be Christ-like. And that testimony, that story you share is very effective because it's your experience. God wants us to share. How to present a winning testimony. Number one. My life before I knew Christ. Before I knew Christ, I was on drugs. I was a bad person. How I became a Christian. Oh, Jesus, he changed my life by doing this, 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 this. My life after I became a Christian, now was wonderful. But then you know, Christians, you get some bumps in the road. Christianity is not the easiest thing on planet Earth. But this is how you prepare a testimony. And now you write it out, practice it, and use it. When? The time is now. The time is now. My last slide, there it is. How we began. Many would be willing to work if they were taught how to begin. We were taught how to begin today. You pray, you spend time with God. You see God on a daily basis, and then you can share. Because you and I, you cannot share something you don't have. 
if you did not have morning worship, if I didn't have morning devotion, how can I share with somebody that which I don't have? Doesn't that make sense? Yeah. So let's get really practical. Really practical. Anybody ever see these before? What's the name of this? Glow track. Very simple witnessing tool, isn't it? You know, one day I was at the gas station. I went to pump gas. I went to grab the handle, and there was something stuck there. You know what was stuck in the handle? Yeah. <laughs> it was like one of these. It was stuck right there. And I said, man, that's wonderful. That's really, really nice. Because, you know, some people, they are very intimidated to talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. Some people are just intimidated. Is that an excuse? No way, Jose. No, because when God has done something in your life, you have to tell somebody. So when people say, well, I'm an introvert, I'm not buying that. I'm not extroverted like you, Pastor Mirage. Maybe we're all are different, but I'm not buying that because you love Jesus, you will tell somebody. So don't give me that introvert stuff. No, no, no. <laughs> Glow track. Leave it at a gas station. You can um, leave it when you go to your dentist. Leave it on the dental, at the table. See? If you leave it on the table, you, you're, not talk, you're not talking to anybody. Now, if you put a glow track on the table and the table talks back to you, <laughs> that's a problem. <laughs> you better run. <laughs> but hey, <laughs> you don't got to worry about anything. <laughs> the table won't talk to you. The gas pump won't talk to you. But you're still doing something for the master. You know what somebody uh, at my former church, what they do? You know how you get a bill in the mail, let's say, say a bill from Verizon. And in that envelope, you have a blank envelope to put your payment inside and you mail it off to Verizon. You know what I'm referring to? They could have an envelope in there for you. Put your check in there, you send it. This person will take three glow tracks, put it inside of the Verizon envelope with the check, and then mail it to Verizon. That's awesome. That's so practical. So in that person, you don't know who's going to open it because the machine does not open the envelope. So that person opens the envelope, gets the bill. Oh, what's this? You don't know what that person is going to do with it. You don't know. That's why it's not up to you. The Holy Ghost does the rest. You, you just plant the seed and God waters it. The point is, I'm making myself clear this, this afternoon is, do what? Something. Do something. You can do this. Who can't do that? Who can't go to the gas pump? Who can't leave something at a restroom or something? Who can't leave it at a, with a, the tip for the waiter or the waitress? Who can't do that? Brothers and sisters, time is short. And the wife says, that man was screaming and pointing at directions, pointing at every direction, saying that we are the ones that are sleeping. We should be at the forefront at, of witnessing, not Jehovah's Witness. You know that? You see folk walking down the street going door to door? Who are they? Exactly. You see them uh, Yeah, in a bicycle with a white shirt, black pants, and a little badge. Who's that? Where are the Adventists? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We're the Adventists. You can't find us. Where's our uniform? You can't find us. And that, that's why for me, I can't condemn those Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. They're doing more as it pertains to witnessing than Adventists. Can't condemn them. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. That's very good. And you know, that's, that's very good. You know, television, YouTube, uh, Facebook, these are very powerful mediums for the gospel. But at the end of the day, though, you and I still have to do something. And that's why I love those Jehovah's Witnesses. When I see those Mormons, I'm just in awe. Like, man. We shouldn't let them have all the fun. You look at them, it's like, man, God, these folks really believe in what they're doing. 
And we're the ones, we know exactly how it's going to go down. But sad to say, very few Seventh-day Adventists witness. Very few. Hmm? Why? They're sleeping. Not about for real. That's what she said. That's what she said in the Bible says. Just sleeping spiritually. Because see, the thing is, Lacey, if there's no passion inside of someone for Jesus, if there's no passion there, there'll be no passion to share. That's why I'm so passionate when I preach. A lot of times when I'm preaching, I actually, I literally have to hold myself together because it's so exciting. Because there's a passion there that you can't explain. Because Jesus has done something in my life. He changed my life, and there's a passion. there. And so, Lacey, that's why people don't witness. You don't spend time with Jesus, you're not going to witness. But I just want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, please, please, do something for the master. And then, Calvin. Mm-hmm. Oh, excellent. You know when you, have, you can have the opportunity sharing your experience? Well, I know. I'll be that with you. <laughs> Anytime. Anytime. Someone you meet. Even with family members. It doesn't have to be a stranger. You can tell like a family member that's not in Christ, hey, man, God did this for me. He can do the same for you. You can share. Excellent. Calvin? Um, when I was down at the pool, there was no mm-hmm. Yeah, any, excellent. Excellent. Hey, you know, that's really good because dogs or any kind of pet get a lot of attention. Yeah, a lot of, you can just strike a conversation with Jesus easily. And you know, some people, and we're going to pray because it's 2 o'clock, I want to stick to my word. Some people, they say, um, man, I lost my train of thought. I'm so tired. Because <laughs> see, I have the preacher day, and then I have a board meeting tonight at the other church. And then tomorrow is a constituency meeting, and then a board meeting here. Well, there's a lot to do, but you got to love it. I love it. But this is what I was going to say. Some people, they say, you know, uh, they're timid and they're shy and uh, they just can't share. Now, I can understand that, being timid and shy. But look, folks, again, I repeat, if you knew trouble was on the way, you would want to know. You would want to be outside of harm's way. Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists, we, we know what's coming. We know about the mark of the beast. No one else knows about that. We know about the time of trouble. We know about the Sunday law. We know about all these things. Please share with someone. And so I want to challenge you, my church family, as we pray, I want to challenge you. Next week, Saturday... Is why, what's the date next week? 13. If you come here, Fresno Asian, 16, 13, whatever. I'm, <laughs> I'm listening to you, Lacey. <laughs> if you come here next week, the 16th, and you haven't shared anything about Jesus, you should really, really be thinking. Lord, do I have a passion for you? You know, sometimes people, when they first come into Adventist church or any church, they're really excited for Jesus. But then sooner or later, that excitement fades. For me, if I'm not sharing, I'll be honest with you, if I'm not giving glow tracks, going door to door, my passion for Jesus will go downhill. You know why? Because this stuff is biblical. It's biblical. Hearing sermons, you know, the problem is a lot of Adventists, they love sermons too much. A sermon is only like 30 minutes, 40 minutes. A 40-minute sermon cannot keep you for seven days. This needs to be on a daily basis. So I encourage you, share, do whatever it takes. You got some very practical training here. Put these somewhere, put an address, uh, whatever it takes. Just do something for the master. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for these 30 minutes spent with you in very practical training. The Lord, you want us to share what we believe. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The Bible says we need to sleep. 
uh, I mean awake. We need to awake out of sleep. And we're just, we're just spiritually tired. But God, we need to work because the day is going to come when no man can work. And what we have, the truth that we have, the world desperately needs it. God bless us. Pray that you'll um, give us protection as we travel to our various destinations. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.